This is Spencer with The MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Megan Griffiths, a friend of the show. We had you on back in, gosh, South by Southwest two years ago? 2012, yeah, I think. Okay, for Eden. Um, Now we're coming to Lucky Them, uh, your latest project, which would make sense since it's about two years later. Um, (laughs) And I want to sort of start with the general uh, background of Lucky Them first. I remember, I don't know how many years ago it was, reading about how Paul Newman was connected with the project and was, it was one of the last projects he was connected to before his death and that Joan Woodward's wife took over after he died. Um, How exactly did it get from her taking over the project to you taking over the project? (laughs) <laughs> leading the project because she's still connected my way to in. it. Yeah. Um, I was, okay, so back to the beginning. It was written by Emily Wachtel. The Big Bang. Uh, the, yeah, let's start. <laughs> let's go far, far back. No, uh, Emily Wachtel wrote this script probably 11 years ago. Um, and yeah, she's been uh, shepherding this project for a long time. Um, and she um, grew up with Clea Newman, is her best friend, who's one of Paul and Joanne's daughters. And so uh, she's close with... Um, both Paul and Joanne, the Nooms. Um, and, uh, and so she showed the script to Paul before he passed away and he was a big supporter of it and he was planning on sort of helping however he could. In fact, he sent the script to Thomas Hayden Church, one of the actors in the film. Um, before he passed away, and Tom was attached for six years. There's a, um, there's a moment there that sort of sounded kind of where we were like before Tom was in church passed away. I was like, oh, I did no. not hear about that. Live and well. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. Um, but yeah, no, before Paul passed away, he had sent the script to Thomas Hayden Church, who got, who came attached to the project and was for six years. And then. Wow, he, that's dedication. It's dedication. And Hollywood. it's also, I don't know, I feel like it's such a good role for Thomas Hayden Church that I, perfect, I'm yeah. like really happy because I read it, when I read it, I thought of him. Like every, every line just came out. Straight his, up his voice. T Church. Um, so yeah, so just to jump back again a little bit, um, after Paul passed away, Joanne sort of took on the project and became an executive producer. And then, um, and she has, you know, sort of been a uh, supporter and sending, also sending the script to actors that we liked. And we were able to sort of, um, collect this amazing cast because everybody has a lot of respect for both Paul and Joanne. And so, um, so yeah, and then Emily, um, was looking for a director a couple of years ago. Uh, I was talking to my fr- our mutual friend, uh, Colin Trevaro, who directed Safety Not Guaranteed. And we'll, we'll be touching on him soon enough. I got I got a side connection that we're going to do. Do you? Okay. Uh, well, Emily it was is also friends with Colin, and Colin was in town to present Safety at SIF, actually. Oh, so and he and I, this two funny. years ago. Yeah. Um, it's, it's I remember him. I talked to him while he was in Seattle for that. Yeah, and we went to the Mecca when his movie was playing, because uh, yes. I'd seen it a few times by that point um, and uh, and we're just chatting and this project came up and he uh, said you know what I actually think he'd be a really good fit for Lucky Them do you want to read it and I said sure so I read the script the next day and then the following day I got on the phone with Emily and we hit it off and she came out to Seattle to kind of get a lay of the land because the film was set in New York and we moved it here so uh, and it's just kind of like it's a freight train from there it's, it's interesting um, to think about that coming off of Eden, because obviously Eden got you a fair amount of buzz, but if I sit back and think about it, in a lot of ways, the off hours kind of feels like it could be a good sort of transition into Lucky Them, considering sort of like the setting, the right. sort of the flow of it. It maybe flows a little bit. Yeah, it's, it definitely feels like a big left turn from Eden, and yes. I, give it a lot, I give a lot of credit to the producers for believing that I could pull it off. Um, and also to Colin, because, you know, it's Colin Trevorrow planting that seed um, that, that he thought, I, he's like, you're going to watch Eden and you're going to think it's not the same kind of movie. She's not right for it. But he's like, just talk to her on the phone and you'll see it's like way closer to her personality. So. And you know, he's a gutsy dude for taking on Jurassic Park. Like, that's, I know, man. <laughs> that's a uh, that guy bold was, decision. That guy just, uh, just went right into the stratosphere after safety. Seriously. And deservedly so. Um as you mentioned, one of the big things was transitioning the movie to Seattle. Um, I guess there's a couple of things to ask about that. How significant to you was it to bring it to Seattle? And what, 
I mean, it seemed to work very well in terms of like the Seattle music scene. I mean, I don't know how that's viewed nationally, perhaps, but it feels very much in line with the Seattle music scene. What was it like in terms of actually transitioning the project to Seattle in terms of the script? Yeah, I mean, it, de- it definitely, because Seattle's so known for its music, it seemed like such a natural fit to have a movie that's so music-based set here. And the story, I don't know, the characters felt like Seattle people to me when I read it, even though it was based in New York at that point. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not Nice to hear you say that the, it feels very you know accurate of the music scene here because I feel like everyone kind of has their own the people who don't live here have a lot of perspective on like that that is not necessarily well, I mean, accurate. It's so like like when she's <laughs> walking right in the beginning out of the the bar I think it was like Numos uh-huh. um, and she's walking through. Uh, pine at that point. I was just like, this is so straight up like anyone who's been to there experiences <laughs> that, you know. I know. Yeah, it definitely feels a lot closer to my version of Seattle than than any film I can think of. Um, it's just, it, you know, there's a lot of, we got to shoot a lot of iconic places like the Crocodile and the Comet before it switched. Rob Roy. Yeah, yeah we shot Vermilion. Uh, yeah, there's this. You can if you live here, you will recognize uh, every place. One of my favorite was uh, down at Occidental Park for the office. It's yeah. like right at Grand Central Bakery. I was right. like, I could, uh, <laughs> every time she walked in the door, I was like, Grand Central Bakery, Grand Central Bakery. Just, <laughs> yeah, they were really nice to let us shoot there. But that, that exterior is so amazing. Oh, it's and great! Then, it's fantastic. Then yeah. we were shooting at a building that the exterior was not quite so exciting, but the the interior of the the place that she works is this building called the Trigger Building in Pine, mm. in uh, in Soto, and it is like the best location. I it, love that. It worked perfect for the office. Yeah, and, it I felt mean, like where that would be in Seattle. Like if some, we talked about John Lavin and I, the production designer, talked about Stacks, the, the magazine and the film being like if Sub Pop were a magazine, mm. sort of like this thing that sort totally of grew in the early '90s and got this international prominence when Seattle was the sort of in the in the spotlight, and then as uh, that sort of ended their their cred kind of kept going. So that's kind of what we were going for. And that's pretty sex. much exactly what popped to my mind when yeah. I saw like Oliver Platt and her talking in that office. I was like, this feels like Sub Pop. Like, well, they gave us a lot of that stuff. Yeah. They loaned us a lot of that stuff. Right. Those are, you know, mementos, you know, that are hanging on the Sub Pop walls that they just let us borrow, which is amazing of them. Did you have to, I mean, I, I hate to use the word fight, but how much of a... Um, a negotiation was it to get it to be moved to Seattle? I mean, so it, many people it wasn't a fight love New York. All. Like, yeah. It's, a, it's a, such a popular thing, but, you know. They were to already, to, before I even came on, they were talking about moving it out of New York just because New York is an expensive Cost, place yeah. to shoot. And, uh, and as much as I think it was always set there in Emily's mind, she... When, you know, when she got here, she, she also could see it here. And then when we were shooting it, people kept asking her if it felt strange. And she said, it actually doesn't really feel different. It feels like appropriate. So I think it just was a story. Maybe it was always destined to come here, but, um, it, no one, it, no one needed a lot of arm twisting to get it here. It, it did seem perfect, which is kind of nice. And one of the interesting things about like you and Lynn and a few other filmmakers is that there seems to be a very strong, love of Seattle and I guess Washington State in general and it's it's kind of interesting to see how much film has been brought to the state because of you guys when I mean it would have been very easy to do this I mean shit, it could probably have done a lot of in like Vancouver or something mm-hmm. for a lot cheaper and with yeah, bigger they t- definitely talked about other music cities too before I came on so yeah I mean it is that's really it's really nice to be able to say that something was shot here in large part because sort of that you made efforts to make that happen. And, uh, you know, I think that, and I've had a lot of crew who have worked on my stuff that are amazing that, you know, like from off hours where nobody was getting paid through Eden and to Lucky Them, it's nice to, you know, be able to sort of give back to the community that way. I mean, it's it's such, I mean, it's funny to compare it to places like L.A., but it, it's it's small enough that it really feels like a family like everybody knows everybody like yeah. it's it's such a small world you look on facebook and it's like this person's gonna know this person this person it's just amazing everybody i have a friend on facebook in seattle we have like 150 <laughs> mutual friends. yeah it's pretty amazing yeah <laughs> at least so in terms of the the casting of this movie i mean you mentioned thomas hayden church being involved with it and he's perfectly cast uh, I know before you were involved, like Marissa Tomei was attached to it and stuff like that. How did you ultimately end up with the cast you have? I mean, Tony Collette's 
wonderful. Like uh, pretty much everyone's. Yeah, wonderful. it's funny because films, I think, especially ones that have a history as long as this film's history, um, they tend to go through a lot of incarnations. I know with Off Hours, we had several different casts attached along the way. And a lot of times that doesn't get written about. There's no press release. But in this case, I think there were a few along the way. So, like, it, there was press releases about Marissa being involved. I and, mean, any, anyone that has, like, huge names attached to them, like, Laggies have Anne Hathaway or something it at did, one point. Yeah, so anytime some, like, switch. big name yeah. leaves, like, that generates, like, all those publicity things so like off hours you're not going to hear about changes, but yeah <laughs> hey wait no um <laughs> but yeah no i think in this case tom was the only one who was attached when i came on board and i wouldn't have changed it for anything because it just like i said as i was reading it i was just like this is such a great role for him i love thinking about him playing this part totally. um and then um then we kind of went to the drawing board and said who do we want to play all these roles and tony collette came up early and we all just were like oh my god that would be great because she's such a brilliant actress and she doesn't get the opportunity to play roles like this that often like she she plays she's done you know, huge variety of amazing stuff, but, um, she's, uh, you know, it's a lead role and it's sort of a sexy lead role. And I, I think, you know, she was ready to do something like that. And she's all about music. It's like huge, huge music fan. So she, she loved that aspect of it. She's married to a musician and yeah. So, uh, she was, she was pumped to do it. And Oliver Platt came up because he and I share an agent and, um, and I just, I've been a fan of him oh, for, totally. for decades as well. So his role as well. yeah, I agree. I think he's just, I, we just got totally, we totally scored when casting all around. One of the interesting ones is that Ryan Agold, mm-hmm. um, mostly because it seems like you guys got him like right before he was about to pop. Yeah. And then you got the benefit of him popping right as this film is starting. I know to like, it's handy. Like he started blacklist right after uh, we shot. And then now I guess his character has been going through these bigger, like more like attention grabbing changes. So people know him and, yeah. and are recognizing him from that. Um, and now I see him in like car commercials and weird stuff like that. Or I'm just like, oh. I mean, he's awesome and he's been around for a long time. He's been doing a lot of like television and um, he was on the 90210, the remake version really? and the, and uh, that show with Courtney Cox, um, where she was the tabloid oh, columnist, dirty the, or dirt. Yeah. Like that, the dirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he was on that. He's he has a lot of television history. He was on the United States of Terra with the uh, Tony. West. That's hilarious. That's yeah. like perfect. <laughs> uh, so, one of the interesting things about this movie is having music as a backdrop element. I mean, it's about musicians, about covering musicians. Uh, how difficult was it? You know, having music in the movie. I always wonder about this, you know, with movies that are sort of music centric in terms of like writing music for them. It's sort of like, how do we write a catchy jam for this character to sing or something <laughs> well, like I that? Well, Ryan Eggold wrote all of the songs, his characters. He That's sings, I mean. he performs three songs in the film and he, he, he composed them all himself um, and obviously performed them his, himself too. So he's a multi-talented guy and we weren't expecting that. We thought if we could find somebody who could perform songs, we'd That'd be, be a like in a in, score. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he ended up just getting so like, he was like the inspired by this, character and the the script he just was writing songs immediately and we had a composer who was also writing songs and we ended up just using all ryan's because they were just like appropriate and uh and so like he's like now performing them at events and stuff like that and i don't know i think he's a rock star waiting to happen um but uh anyway so that worked out and then um we had also a composer for the film craig wedron who composed you know he didn't compose any of the songs that are performed but the entire score which you know keeps the movie moving along that's all him and he's awesome he was in the band shutter to think in the 90s interesting one of the i mean one of the key components of the movie is this sort of mystery about what happened to uh matthew smith i believe is the name of the character um there's a little bit of music for him what where did that come from yeah there is a song in the film that is may or may not be him you know just ba- oh, really? based on sort of like oh, okay, as you yeah, yeah, sort of interpretation that. of the scene that follows but um but that song in that scene is Damien Gerardo who's local also and is awesome and I love that song we just tried a lot of different existing songs we tried composing a song for that scene and just nothing fit as well as that song it's just this montage that kind of goes over sort of the the, the spiraling <laughs> of this character that Tony plays uh, and that song just really like when I watched it every time it would sort of 
move me emotionally where yeah, other songs maybe wouldn't. And so, I, yeah, I love that song now, especially it just comes up on my shuffle on my iPad and I'm like, oh, it's the best. It's, it's sort of interesting. Another thing I think about what I think about musical centric movies is there a soundtrack or is there going to be a soundtrack that comes out? Because that seems like yeah, for something like one. this, yeah. that's kind of it should, a There should be a soundtrack. I have yeah. the soundtrack on my iPad and I can tell you it is great. I listen to it all the time. <laughs> I'm not sick of it yet. Um, and But it, it's like a challenge to get. I mean, it's oh, one thing to get to pay for rights. And we, you know, we had a pretty restrictive music budget for the movie considering it's not a huge, huge budget. But um, we got all these things, you know, based on people being sort of kind and giving with their music. Um, but it's a whole other thing to license music for a soundtrack, and the expense of it has been daunting for a few people. So I think if the movie does well, there's more of a chance that the soundtrack Make will come Make it happen, out. people. Yeah, come on, MacGuffin listeners. <laughs> <laughs> come out. Millions of dollars are going to come because of this, no doubt. But people have told me that, and you know, you don't exactly want people to pull their cell phones out in your movie, but people have told me that they've taken their phone out to Shazam songs while they're going so they can buy them later. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's a I'm more like, that's a practical compliment. use of Shazam. Like, did you ever hear about the Spider-Man thing? Like, if no. you took out your phone during the credits of Spider-Man and Shazam, some song, like it led you to like some secret website that would then tell you about some characters that might be in a future Spider-Man movie. I was just like, I was like, how on earth are you going to unearth that's that? A cool like, Easter who egg? would ever think to like be like, all right, I'm going to Shazam every song and see what it takes me to? Like, I'd we had an idea for this movie. You know how those there's those barcode type things that you can read with your iPhone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. QR codes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were going to, um, Rebecca Luke, the costume designer, had this idea of putting one of those on a T-shirt for Ryan Eggold's character and oh, having it be clever. that, like, if you if you paused your movie at a certain point, it would take you to the website of the film. That's, I love that that's idea. That's kind of a clever idea. And we yeah. didn't do it, but, like, maybe another movie. Yeah, Rebecca you should, you should that hold on to that out. one. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Put that in your pocket. Yeah. One of the interesting things about this movie is there's sort of two storylines that go along that ultimately intersect and that's sort of like Tony Collette sort of evaluating where she is in her life and the sort of backdrop of having to hearken back or I guess it's largely driven in part because she's forced to look into this mystery of this former love of hers that kind of sends her spiraling as you mentioned and there's this mystery storyline that kind of is running on and off throughout the the movie how is it juggling those sort of two stories? Because, I mean, either you could have made it very mystery-centric yeah. or you could have much ma- made that like almost a MacGuffin in and of itself. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could in some ways argue that it still Yeah, is. I mean, it, for me, it's just like, you know, it's all about sort of character journey and where it happens to lead. And, and they are on this search, and her and Thomas Church's character, and they just... Uh, are this inept detective duo. And it's funny to me that they would, like, you know, I think the way that their search proceeds, interrupted by life here and there, yeah. is just natural to who those characters are. And, um, and I like that. And we try to, like, play up the mystery a little bit with music. We have a mm. whole, like, sort of, um, sort of, you know, film noir type of theme when they actually are getting close to yeah, stuff that yeah. th- runs throughout the movie. And that was funny to me, too, just to kind of, like, show how not good at it they were. Well, um, I also liked all of our plat because, like, there'd be times I was like, how much time has gone by? And he'd be like, a scene later, be like, you've spent two weeks extra on this. What are you doing? I'd be like, thank you, Oliver Platt, for sort of giving me <laughs> he's context a, he's there of to how long this is taking. You. I was like, wait a minute, this wedding's happening? Like, isn't this, like, how could this be so fast? And he's like, you're three poo- weeks past deadline i'm like okay oliver platt thank you for answering Thanks these all. questions that i've yeah, had no it's uh it, it definitely you know his character really kind of like is the glue that holds this whole thing together and we only had him for two days we shot his stuff in the first That's two funny. days of the shoot and uh and we really had to we crammed some we have a scene that we shot that isn't even in the film with him but like we we got One a lot of features yeah exactly oh everyone my God. wants more uh, they're all going away these bonus features it's like tragic to me this like you can't it's hard to get dvds with i mean you can't get dvds with special features anyway you have to get blu-ray and then when it's all streaming i don't know where it's all going to be yeah i've actually wonder about that i know itunes is sort of doing a little bit with itunes extras which includes some like netflix needs to get on that too i don't like i like i don't for the life of me understand why this is a sorry weird side note why netflix doesn't have any sort of bonus feature stuff on it or why um 
Criterion really hasn't done more to embrace the digital format. Like, right. if, if anyone should be like, we're going to do digital, we're going to do it with the bonus features, let's, like, make this I all happen. I completely, because like, I love that stuff. I love Like, it, totally. when I like a movie, I want to hear the commentary, and I want to just, like, dive into all the details. And it's getting, I mean, it's just getting really hard to do it. And I want to provide that stuff, too, with my totally. stuff, just because... You know, it's like, I mean, with the off hours, the DVD is ridiculous. There's so many special features and commentaries and stuff Which like that. Which is great. But it's like we had to do it ourselves. Nobody. But th- like, like that's the best thing. It. Like I, that's one of the things that like I appreciate. Like there's some like fundamental weird small things that drive me nuts about independent film where I'm just like, I don't understand why you don't want to do this. Like um, creating a trailer, creating a website, creating a poster, doing special features if you can. Because it's like, I will happily promote your film. I I want to do it. Yeah. But if I can't tell anyone a website where to go, or if I can't show anyone a trailer of why your film is awesome, it really makes it hard for me to be like, oh shit, there's this film I saw. You got to check out. <laughs> I, I don't know if it'll ever play, play anywhere. Play. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if you'll ever be able to see it, but it was sweet. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know. You, you, especially with the smaller movie, like yeah, with Off Hours, we just basically to do everything and um, like that DVD is that's great homemade like I that's built the menus great. and routed all the I love it. stuff it was like it, but I love that it exists and totally. like I can it's like a it but re- I, I'm re- in the exact same space as you like I mean I would love to own every movie I like but I at the same time I've just gotten tired of like physical space of DVDs and stuff. It's like, yeah. It just takes up so much space and then it's like, oh, DVD's out. Pfft, now I gotta buy the Blu-ray and it's sort of like, I would just rather like be able to buy iTunes, yeah. have them deal with the scaling, the format and stuff, but give me the fucking special features too. Like, it makes no sense. Director's commentary. I would love to hear the director's commentary of this movie. Me too. I hope we can do one. <laughs> do it right now. Yeah. So, opening scene. Girl smoking in the hallway. Carolani Sanford. <laughs> I know, I know. I actually resident. went back and looked. I was like, oh my god, I know Carolani. I went back and looked just for it. I was like, aha, that's it. <laughs> yeah, so just right now. We're going to start right now. Start, uh, boom, now. Um, so... This premiered at Toronto 2013. It's yep. done Tribeca. It's doing SIF now. Um, I know it's on VOD. I've seen that on DirecTV. And it's stuff. on DirecTV exclusively, actually, okay. right now. Well, that explains then, why I saw it there. Though. Yeah, that, it, they had a pre-window of a month. Um, and then on May 30th, it's coming out in New York and on VOD. So you'll be able to get it on other digital, Everywhere. like iTunes and and so forth and then it has a rolling release theatrically too so it's coming out on June 6th in LA and then June 15th in Seattle or sorry 13th in Seattle in terms of um, the release to VOD and whatnot how has your experience been with that I mean I know like a lot of filmmakers love theatrical experience it seems like that seems to be the more practical route for a lot of indie films Um, have you noticed benefits to it has like i mean what i mean is it like yeah i i should embrace i definitely do to a degree embrace the vod thing i know it means that more people will see or have the opportunity to see the movie and i appreciate that part of it because it's you know a lot of movies aren't released in in sort of the midwest and other parts of the country that aren't big cities um but they're at the same time it's hard because uh, as a filmmaker, most people don't get into the business to make something that's watched on a laptop. It's it's just kind of like it's a weird sort of a, no, and also absolutely. having watched Lucky Them in a room full of people versus watching it in a room of like one or two people, it grows. The experience grows so much when you watch it in a group. I, I absolutely like agree with you. The laughs grow and, and the, it's just. But more there's fun. like a double edged sword to both of them. Like you yeah. know, I was talking with someone yesterday and they're like, "Oh, I love going to movies in the theaters." I was like, "You know, what? I totally agree with you." But I can't tell you how many times I've had someone fucking pull out a phone in the movie and start texting and stuff like that. I don't it's, see that very often, but I think it's because uh, Seattle is pretty. Seattle's legit. okay. I, I still see it a fair amount. <laughs> yeah, you'd be surprised. But also the other, the flip side is like, you know, I was saying like, I love going to movies, but like $12 for one ticket, I can pay for more than a month of Netflix with one ticket. It's sort of like this sad double-edged sword where it's like, I it's don't know. A, yeah, and, and, and nobody makes money on the, like theatrical releases anymore. They're, they're I mean, if you, you have to put a lot of P&A press 
print advertising into um, a release to get anyone to know even it even exists. So it's like one thing to open in theaters and another thing to promote the fact that you're in theaters. And that, I think, is where indie films like don't quite get... I, there was an article that Manola Dargis wrote um, for the New York Times a f- few months ago where she talked about how there's too many movies in theaters. And it's just like, it's hard for people to parse through them and figure out what they like, but... I don't necessarily think there's too many th- movies in theaters. Yeah, I, I just think, think it's problem. like th- th- there's not enough equal opportunity. She was talking about how oh, the, the the movies that uh, are studio movies are the ones that are getting nominations, and you hear about them, and I'm like, because they have twenty million dollar yeah. ad budgets. Well, that, you know? that's like I don't know if you ever heard of like Kevin Smith when he released Red State and toured it himself. Like yeah. he was talking about like he went to studios and was like pitching the idea to them, and he's like, oh, I want to do it for five million dollars. It'll be super cheap. Let's do it this way, and they're like. Um, yeah, we're gonna do this for like thirty million. And he's like, I don't need thirty million. He's like, that's that's the way with advertising all this. This is gonna equate to be a thirty million dollar film. It's just like that's the sad state of affairs. Is that you yeah. can't make small films cheaply. Like it's just you can't do it in Hollywood, or you can't be embraced in the Hollywood well, system. Yeah, there's by just it. a way of doing things that people are very accustomed to, and um, and it is it is tricky. I mean, it, it's hard. Like if you're not if you don't already have the followers that Kevin Smith has to get oh, the sure. word like, out it's for ridiculous. something like yeah, that like is like it's, really it's challenging. It's not fair to equate Kevin Smith to like a regular film <laughs> because like yeah, like he yeah, has millions spent, of followers you know, on Twitter. He was a giant indie darling for years, and like uh, now he has a podcast where a lot of people oh, he has like listen a cult and, following. Yeah, so like, for he sure. definitely is a is it's is easy for not him to someone say you can that, hold yeah. up as like this is the example. I'm <laughs> this is follow. the playbook. Do it You got to spend all this time like. Come on, you can't fill Macaho. Just rolling release for this. Come on, <laughs> what's your problem? No. I can do it. Yeah, um, yeah Seattle, you might be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's 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 interesting. It's the whole distribution thing is is sort of on its ear at the moment, and and I don't know where it's going to land with all the digital technology stuff. Um, but I'm trying to remain open minded to it because I know, like, I definitely am, I came of age in this theatrical world, and I love seeing movies in the theater. I love having my film seen in the theater. Like, I, it's hard to embrace the idea of, of it going into these homes where I don't get any sort of feedback. I don't, totally. I don't know that it's happening. It's really difficult to but get at the same time numbers like, from anybody. You can't- Fight it, like that's that's a losing it. battle. Like no, there's I'm no, not you're not, there's no it. way. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like there's no way you have to embrace it in some capacity and try and sort of maybe morph it into like a combination or whatever, which is what you guys are doing with the VOD. Yeah, and, and it's a day and date release, which is means that it's VOD same the day. same day as theatrical. Um, and uh, technically, it's ultra VOD because we did the the <laughs> the month long window before with Directv. There's ultra all these VOD. like terminology, yeah, interesting, interesting. but uh, <laughs> but like yeah. So you know, there there's all these things people are trying, and you know, it's all just a, a way to try to help monetize the movie to help make it so mm-hmm. that people can continue making films and that it's a business that is sustainable and that makes money and that you know that you you never want to like just continuously make things that don't make any money because ultimately you're going to burn out anyone who 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 invest in you and and Seattle's had problems with that anymore. in the past, so it's, like we yeah. don't want to, we don't want to go down that we route again. Need, yeah. Um, let's let's little, pivot a little bit and look forward. So now you're finally okay. sort of reaching the end of this journey. It's been two years since the last one. What is next for Megan? And I've sort of sorry to Matthew McConaughey for ripping this off. I'm sort of terming this time as the Meganaissance. So <laughs> run with that if you I'll will. Take it, yeah. sure. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll give him credit for the original idea, but <laughs> it still works pretty well, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I am not positive what w- will be seen to the outer world as my next project, but I'm currently working on a couple things. Oh, fantastic. Um, and uh, I've, I've been attached for almost a year now to a film uh, that is being produced by Infinite M. Nile, which is Johnny Depp's production company. I know. Um, that's like a psychological thriller. Hopefully that's going to be happening that's soon. Cool. We've been casting. It's been a bit of a process. but um, And then I'm writing a movie for Lifetime right now. It's going to be good, Did Spencer. You, is it a babysitter who kills the husband who's having an affair with her <laughs> while somebody dies from cancer? <laughs> it's not, but that's maybe the next one. No, it's a, it's, it's a biopic on a, a real life serial killer who terrified me as a child not me personally but like the idea of him and i won't reveal who it is but um, is mark harman playing it i don't think so (laughs) i don't believe so although i'd love summer school so i'm a fan of mark i think you already played ted bundy to be fair but (laughs) uh, i think uh that's good 
Here's where we get back to Colin Trevorrow. Okay, great. Trevorrow. Trevorrow. Yeah. Okay, thank you for correcting me. <laughs> he went to Jurassic World after Safety Not Guaranteed. I feel like this is a somewhat comparable level to Safety Not Guaranteed. Okay. And I'm thinking now's the time you got to jump to the action films. All right. What, thinking, what do you su- suggest? Uh, I'm thinking either uh, maybe we can. It might be a little bit of a fight, but uh, I'm thinking either the next Star Trek. We might have a little bit of a fight with, uh, I think, right. uh, Robert Orsi, Roberto Orsi. I have to go back and watch one at no, least of the other yeah, Star Trek movies. Yeah, I need to do that. That's not a problem. <laughs> not a problem. Uh, I'm thinking either episode eight after J.J. comes back. All right. That I can jump on board yeah. with. I'm a fan of or the original trilogy. Avengers 3. All right. Those are the one, the three. I I'm like Avengers right one. In. I haven't seen the second one. It hasn't I, come out I yet. To know. be fair, it doesn't I'm come out for I'm thinking, you know, I have a, a history of, of making damaged women movies, so maybe like oh, you can Wonder make Woman, any. something like that. Like uh, who's gonna make that movie? Well, I mean, that could be. Like, I guess yeah, she, yeah. There <laughs> we go. Better yet, yeah. Justice League. There's one for you. There we go. I'll take it. She could be the lead in that. Thanks, I mean, she, Spencer, you can make her own film. Like I don't understand why they didn't make a Wonder Woman movie. Like they made the TV series years and years ago, and that was super popular. It was super popular. Yeah. It's like what? Like it's easy money. Like there's no question She's about that. Ass. I don't understand that one either. That one's just been a mystery. But uh, yeah, that's yeah. a great one. See, okay, there we go. Now we're talking. Yeah, badass yeah. women. Okay, I, I like where you're headed with this. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna need what a two hundred million dollar budget for this. Yeah. Anyone? So uh, Warner Brothers, you own the rights to that. So start putting that money aside. We've got your director set up. Yeah, I'm busy right now anyway. So maybe just like squirrel some away for the that's next gonna be, year. It's going to be a few years. Like, you know, <laughs> Justice League is still probably like three years out, so Wonder Woman would probably have to be in phase two of the DC yeah, universe. I'll keep, I'll, go, I'll keep going that direction. Start, start thinking about casting I'm building, right now. I'm continuously building my Damage Women movie resume, so... <laughs> that is true. I would like to uh, not have you be pigeonholed in that range. But, no, uh, I don't so particularly want to be Tony Collette's not really that damaged. Like, she's <laughs> slightly um no, slightly That's just something somebody bummed. told me when I was trying, because I, I consider myself someone who doesn't, I'm not very genre um, driven, but that somebody, when I was telling them what my films were and what scripts I liked and all this stuff, they were like, "You're that's your genre, damaged women movies. And so I'm embracing it because... <laughs> Why not? If you so can get Wonder Woman out of doing it, more fucking power to you. <laughs> like, I, I'm all for that. I would totally go see that in a theater right yeah. now. I'll say oh that right God, now. Oh, my God, me too. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, so we got that picture down. Um, in terms of Lucky Them, uh, what are those dates coming up? Okay, again? so May 30th, May 30th. Um, in New York and on VOD. Uh, June 6th in LA in theater in theaters. And in June 13th at the Northwest Film Forum here in Seattle. Fantastic. Uh, website? Uh, it is the IFC website for the film. IFC. And so just look at IFC, Lucky, Lucky Them, them and you will find like it. That. I don't know it off the top of my okay. head. And it's, uh, you know, there's, uh, you friend me on Facebook or follow me on Twitter. What is your Twitter? I was going to get uh, right to that. At the Cinechick, um, T-H-E-C-I-N-E-C-H-I-C-K. And I promote on there, basically. And you'll so find out like, what's next for Megan there, presumably. And what this Lifetime movie might end up being. That's right. We'll see. That's I'm a, curious I'm just going to leave that as a little That's a mystery. tantalizing mystery. Yeah. Maybe it was mentioned already in this episode and we don't realize it Ooh. until three years from now. Thank you so Wonder much, Woman Megan. By lifetime. <laughs> I can't wait. To, I can't wait to see what's next. And uh, I, I love Lucky Dem. I even talk about the animals in it, which is awesome too. Oh my God! Yeah. Go see it for yeah. the animals. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Spencer. No problem. Can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. I don't even try to buy the size of size. Mr. Spock can't stop me. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.